Hi, welcome back. In this lecture, we will discuss the morphological abnormalities of the thyroid. In this, we will concentrate on how variable the thyroid enlargement is. There are two kinds of morphological abnormalities of thyroid gland. It can have a discrete thyroid swelling or it can have a generalized thyroid swelling. Discrete thyroid swelling is called nodule and a generalized thyroid swelling is called goiter. So the first morphological abnormality of the thyroid gland is a discrete thyroid swelling. It is also called nodule. Discrete thyroid swellings are common. Most are non-palpable and detected incidentally with imaging of the neck. But about 3 to 4 percent of adult population have palpable nodules. It is more common in females with the female to male ratio is 4 is to 1. There are two kinds of presentations of discrete thyroid swellings. First, it can be a true single or solitary nodule in that the other part of the thyroid gland is normal. Second kind is a dominant nodule of a multinodular goiter in that the thyroid gland other than the nodule also abnormal. Solitary nodules are the commonest type. So 70% of discrete thyroid swelling are solitary nodule and 30% are dominant nodule. Majority that is about 85% of the solitary nodules are benign. There is a 15% chance of malignancy in solitary nodules. The incidence of malignancy or follicular adenoma in a dominant nodule of a multinodular goiter is half of an incidence in solitary nodules. The patients with discrete thyroid swelling should be assessed mainly in four aspects in the clinical history. So the clinical history should cover the features of thyroid dysfunction, risk factors for thyroid malignancy, symptoms suggestive of thyroid cancer, and any compressive symptoms. Discrete thyroid swellings can present with thyrotoxicosis due to toxic nodule or a toxic multinodular goiter. So features suggestive of hyperthyroidism or thyrotoxicosis should be checked. Discrete thyroid swelling can be a part of a thyroiditis which can present with features of hypothyroidism. So the features suggestive of any thyroid dysfunction to be ruled out in discrete thyroid swelling. At the same time, the biochemical assessment of thyroid function is, al is always necessary. What are the risk factors for thyroid malignancy? Most of the benign thyroid nodules are present between the ages of 30 to 50 years. So the probability of malignancy in a nodule is highest at the extremes of the age. Next risk factor is a male gender. The probability of a thyroid nodule proving to be malignant in a man is greater than in a woman. Genetic predisposition and family history of a thyroid cancer is a known risk factor. Medullary thyroid cancers are associated with MEN2 syndrome or familial medullary thyroid cancer. MEN2 syndrome that is multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2 syndrome is associated with pheochromocytoma and primary hyperparathyroidism. So the family history of thyroid cancer especially at an early age or a premature sudden death which suggestive of pheochromocytoma is necessary in the history. Other familial syndromes such as familial papillary thyroid cancer Cowden syndrome and familial adenomatous polyposis can increase the risk of both papillary and follicular cancers. The other risk factors for thyroid malignancy is the radiation exposure to head, neck or upper chest or a breast. For example, if anyone had a radiotherapy for Hodgkin's lymphoma or breast cancer, 
they will have a increased risk to develop thyroid malignancy risk of metastasis to thyroid is rare but the chances are present with previous cancers of lung breast colorectal renal as well as melanoma in the clinical history the assessment of symptoms that suggest you of thyroid cancer are important they include hoarseness of voice rapidly enlarging thyroid nodule or symptoms of local invasion hoarseness of voice is suggestive of vocal cord palsy secondary to infiltration to recurrent laryngeal nerve rapidly enlarging thyroid nodule over the few weeks is suggestive of thyroid cancer so we need to differentiate this from a bleeding into a nodule so in contrast to the malignancy bleeding into a no thyroid nodule will present with an enlargement of nodule over 24 to 48 hours features of local invasion that suggest the thyroid cancer are pain in the same site ear strido dysphagia or hemoptysis compressive symptoms are less with discrete thyroid swellings compared to multinodular goiters these symptoms include the difficulty in swallowing because of the compression to esophagus tightness in the neck or difficulty or noisy breathing due to the compression or deviation of trachea physical examination consists of assessment of thyroid functional status and mainly the neck examination for the assessment of thyroid functional status the hands eyes pretibial area and reflexes are examined and the features of hyper or hypothyroidism are checked neck examination should concentrate the thyroid examination lymph node status and tracheal deviation in thyroid examination the differentiation of true solitary nodule from a dominant nodule of a multinodular goiter should be assessed all levels of cervical lymph nodes are assessed and any palpable cervical lymphadenopathy is present that is highly suggestive of thyroid malignancy the tracheal deviation indicates the extent of the thyroid nodule in one side there are red flag signs for thyroid malignancy they are fixed heart mass in the neck cervical lymphadenopathy strido or hoarseness of voice these features are highly suggestive of thyroid malignancy how will you investigate a discrete thyroid swelling first of all the functional status of the thyroid should be checked tsh alone is adequate if the tsh level is outside the reference range free t4 and free t3 should be measured ultrasound scan is the gold standard investigation the aim of doing ultrasound scan is to differentiate true solitary thyroid nodule from a dominant nodule of a multinodular goiter at the same time it can detect the suspicious and malignant nodules radio isotope scan is done when a solitary nodule presents with features of thyrotoxicosis this is to see whether the hyperfunction is due to the nodule alone or the other part of the thyroid gland is also involved the management is depends on these findings fnac is highly specific and sensitive investigation it can be done in two ways first one is free hand that is fnac is done with palpation alone and the second one is ultrasound guided but ultrasound guided fnac is ideal as this can target the suspicious or solid region in the nodule fnac is depends on ultrasound scan findings x-ray neck anteroposterior and lateral are used to detect the tracheal deviation and tracheal compression but 
CT neck and chest are superior over the plain radiography in that the CT is useful for surgical planning and to assess the superior mediastinum and lungs. Flexible laryngoscopy is replacing the conventional indirect laryngoscope. This is necessary before the surgery of thyroid. Unilateral vocal cord palsy with same site thyroid nodule is usually diagnostic of malignant disease. How can we differentiate benign pathology and malignant pathology in ultrasound scan of thyroid? The features suggestive of benign pathology are spongiform texture, cystic without uh, solid components, isoechogenicity, hypoechoic halo, avascular nodules, and nodules with peripheral vascularity. The malignant features in the ultrasound scan are irregular margins, intranodular vascularity, microcalcifications, or cervical lymphadenopathy. The British Thyroid Association guidelines for the management of thyroid cancer suggest the following classification of sonographic features. U1 is indicate a normal thyroid and U2 indicate it's benign. So U2 lesions do not require FNAC unless there are suspicious clinical features or risk factors for thyroid cancer. U3 lesions are equivocal and U4 lesions are suspicious and U5 lesions are malignant. So U3, U4 and U5 lesions require FNAC. The Royal College of Pathologists recommend the FNAC classification from Thai 1 to Thai 5. So the Thai 1 is inadequate or non-diagnostic, Thai 2 is benign or non-neoplastic and Thai 3 is neoplasm possible. Under Thai 3, there are two variants, atypical or follicular lesions. Thai 4 is suspicious of malignancy and Thai 5 is malignant. The management of solitary thyroid nodule. The management depends on the FNAC features. As Thai 1 is inadequate or non-diagnostic, the FNAC should be repeated. Thai 2 in FNAC is usually managed conservatively, but a repeat FNAC to confirm Thai 2 again is recommended. Surgery is needed if any indications such as compressive symptoms, cosmetic concerns or patient preference. If a solitary thyroid nodule showed Thai 3, and atypical features in FNAC, that is Thai 3A, the FNAC need to be repeated. But if it is 3F or follicular, then the hemithyroidectomy is recommended. Thai 4 or suspicious of malignancy, the hemithyroidectomy is necessary. Thai 5 or malignant lesions require definitive management of malignancy. Next morphological abnormality of the thyroid gland is generalized thyroid swelling or it is called goiter. The goiters are classified into four categories. They are simple goiter, toxic goiter, neoplastic goiter and inflammatory goiter. Simple goiters can be diffuse, for example occurs in physiological goiter or it can be a multinodular goiter occurs in endemic and sporadic goiters. Toxic goiters can be diffuse and it occurs in Graves' disease or toxic goiters can present as a multinodular goiter. Neoplastic goiters can be benign or malignant. Inflammatory goiters can be autoimmune, granulomatous, fibrosing, infective and amyloid. Simple goiters are goiters with clinically and biochemically euthyroid state. It is more common in female that suggests the presence of estrogen receptors in the thyroid tissue. It can be diffuse or multinodular goiter. 
Diffuse simple goiters occur during the increased requirement to thyroxine in puberty and pregnancy. It is called physiological goiter. Simple diffuse goiters can also arise as an endemic or sporadic goiter. The sequence of changes leads to the diffuse goiters to become multinodular goiter. So usually the multinodular goiter is arises from the simple diffuse goiters. The occurrence of simple goiter are mainly due to two stimulation that is TSH and growth factors. TSH stimulation can be due to reduced or absent negative feedback or inappropriately increased secretion of TSH from anterior pituitary. Reduced negative feedback to TSH will occur in iodine deficiency, dishormonogenesis and goitrogens. Goitrogens are foods or substances that will increase the size of the thyroid gland. Basica family vegetables such as cabbage, cauliflower and kale are examples for foods. Drugs such as paraminosalicylic acid, antithyroid drugs and lithium also increase the size of the thyroid. Not only the reduced iodides, the excess iodides consumption also increases the thyroid swelling. The most common and important generalized thyroid swelling is multinodular goiter. Multinodular goiter is the most common disorder of the thyroid gland. It is commonly present as simple goiter, but it can present with toxic goiter as well. As we discussed earlier that the sequence of changes causes diffuse simple goiter to become multinodular goiter. So the multinodular goiter is an end stage result of diffuse hyperplastic goiter. Diffuse goiter is reversible and it has all the lobules with active follicles and uniform iodine uptake due to TSH stimulus. Later there will be a fluctuating stimulus leads to areas of active and inactive lobules. This continuous repetition results mostly inactive nodules and it becomes multinodular goiter. In this stage the goiter is irreversible. So the reversible diffuse hyperplastic goiter will become irreversible multinodular goiter with time. Nodules appear early ages in endemic goiter and later ages such as 20 to 30 years in sporadic goiter. There are different types of nodules a multinodular goiter can have. It can be colloid or cellular or it can develop a cystic degeneration. There can be a bleeding into a nodule and become hemorrhagic nodule. The bleeding into a nodule presents with a rapid enlargement of nodules over 24 to 48 hours. Long-standing nodules will become calcified nodules as well. What are the complications of a long-standing multinodular goiter? Calcification of nodules is a feature of long-standing multinodular goiter. This will present as heart nodule and mimic as thyroid cancer. Long-standing goiter will cause thyrotoxicosis. This is an example for a secondary hyperthyroidism. Follicular carcinomas or sometimes papillary carcinomas arise from multinodular goiter. Hemorrhage into a nodule will lead to dyspnea and tracheal compression or tracheal deviation will cause dyspnea as well. At the same time, they can have a cough and strido. Multinodular goiters are common examples for retrosternal extension. This can obstruct the superior vena cava and esophagus leads to dilated neck veins and dysphagia. When we consider the investigations of multinodular goiter, the thyroid functions to be checked as first-line investigation. 
This will differentiate a simple goiter from toxic goiter. Ultrasound scan of the neck is the gold standard investigation and it helps to check the suspicious nodules and cervical lymphadenopathy. Suspicious nodule may be the dominant nodule or it may not be the dominant nodules. FNAC is only required for suspicious nodule in ultrasound scan. So the ultrasound guided FNAC is ideal for this assessment. Features of retrosternal extension such as swallowing or breathing difficulties need CT scan of thoracic inlet. Treatment of multinodular goiter. If a multinodular goiter is asymptomatic, it is managed conservatively. But total thyroidectomy is considered if any features of underlying malignancy, compressive symptoms, retrosternal extension or cosmetic reason. Radioactive iodine is used in some recurrent multinodular goiter as surgery causes significant complications in a recurrent multinodular goiter. To summarize what we have discussed in morphological abnormalities of thyroid gland, there are two kinds of morphological abnormalities discrete thyroid swelling or nodule and generalized thyroid swelling or goiter. Discrete thyroid swelling can be solitary nodule or dominant nodule of a multinodular goiter. Generalized thyroid swelling can be simple, toxic, neoplastic or inflammatory goiters. Next, we will discuss few important aspects of thyroidectomy. What are the indications of thyroidectomy? They are pressure symptoms, malignant or intermediate pathologies such as Thy3F, that is indicates follicular cytology in FNAC, retrosternal goiter, toxicity, cosmesis or RET genetic mutation in family history of medullary carcinoma of thyroid. There are certain types of thyroidectomy according to the extent of the resection. Total thyroidectomy is a complete excision of thyroid including both lobes, isthmus and pyramidal lobe. If we preserve a small amount of thyroid tissue on one side other than total thyroidectomy it is called near total thyroidectomy. If we preserve small amount of thyroid tissues on both sides and remove the rest of the thyroid gland, it is called subtotal thyroidectomy. Complete resection of one lobe and isthmus preserving only the other part of the lobe is hemithyroidectomy. Excision of isthmus with any pyramidal tissue is isthmusectomy. In the current era, commonly performed procedures are either total thyroidectomy or hemithyroidectomy. Complications of thyroidectomy can be divided into immediate, early or late complications. Immediate complications are damage to structures such as esophagus, trachea and nerves, primary bleeding and thyroid storm. Early complications are reactionary or secondary bleeding causing airway obstruction, strido, hoarseness of voice, hypocalcemia, hypothyroidism, chyle leak and infections. Stitch granuloma and keloid or hypertrophic scars are the late complications. Out of this, the most important complications will be discussed here such as thyroid storm, reactionary bleeding, strido, and hypocalcemia. Thyroid storm or thyrotoxic crisis is a life-threatening complication. It is an acute exacerbation of hyperthyroidism. It occurs when the hyperthyroid state is not controlled before thyroidectomy. Patient will have the features of severe dehydration, hyperpyrexia, restlessness, circulatory collapse, uncontrolled atrial fibrillation, and heart failure. 
Treatment would concentrate on intravenous fluid, cooling the patient with ice packs, giving oxygen, diuretics, digoxin, sedation, and intravenous hydrocortisone. Specific treatment are carbimazole, leucosidine, and propranolol. Reactionary bleeding is the most frequent life-threatening complication. Almost all cases develop within 24 hours after thyroidectomy. The usual cause for this is slippage of ligature or dislodgement of the clots. Bleeding causes laryngeal edema due to the increased compartmental pressure and the airway obstruction will be the consequence. Reactionary bleeding can be identified with neck swelling and strido. If this condition is identified, immediate removal of skin and platysmal sutures are undertaken and the patient should be sent to the theatre for exploration. Strido after thyroidectomy can occur from immediately after extubation to 2-5 to five days after surgery. If a patient develops strido immediately after the extubation, the possible causes are bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy and tracheomalacia. If it is occur after few hours, then it is due to laryngeal edema occurs after reactionary bleeding. Hypocalcemia can cause strido in 2-5 to five days after thyroidectomy. The other important complication is hypocalcemia. It is due to hypoparathyroidism after thyroidectomy. Most commonly it is temporary and transient, but sometimes it is permanent. Hypocalcemia occurs 2-5 to five days after thyroidectomy but it can occur even after 2-3 to three weeks. It is solely because of total thyroidectomy. There are certain risk factors for postoperative hypocalcemia. They are hyperthyroidism, large goiter, preoperatively low serum vitamin D due to low sunlight or alcoholism, level 6 neck dissection and extensive thyroid cancers. The presentations of hypocalcemia are perioral numbness, paresthesia and numbness of the fingertips, chostex sign, carpopedal spasm and in severe hypocalcemia, a tetany. The state of hypocalcemia can be confirmed with serum calcium and ionized calcium. The mild to moderate hypocalcemia can be treated with calcium replacement using oral calcium drugs but severe hypocalcemia need intravenous calcium gluconate given as 10% 10 milliliter over 10 minutes.